So one time I was at a club and I had this person come up to me and said she had a, a notepad and she had a pen and she said, can I get your autograph? And I'm like, um, I don't know who you think I am, but I, I'm just a regular guy here. And she said, oh, come on. I know you're Emilio Estevez. <laughs> and so for those of you who don't know who Emilio Estevez is, he used to be part of the Brat, Brat Pack uh, before. There should be a picture on there. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I, I proceeded to tell her that I am not Emilio Estevez, and uh, she would not believe me. And she said, I tell you what, Emilio. <laughs> she said... I want to take you for a ride in my brand new Porsche. So I looked at her and I said, well, this is how I can prove to you that I'm not Emilio Estevez because my car is a Mercury Bobcat. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you also, when you back up, you have to put your leg out there because the reverse doesn't work. <laughs> so I finally got rid of him, you know. Um, but it was a case of mistaken identity, right? And we're, we're going to be talking about that today. Uh, it's interesting that um, our, our country, uh, California, you know, they're talking about these real IDs now, right? And so by May 2023, uh, you have to look, get, get a real ID. And Jim, if you could put that real ID up on the <laughs> PowerPoint. Uh, but anyway, so these real IDs basically say you can't get on a plane, you can't go to any kind of federal building, a courthouse, or anything like that um, if you don't um, have one of these real IDs. So, uh, so how do you tell the real ID from the fake ID? Well, now ours will have a big bear in the top right there. So if you try to get on a plane, you show me your ID, what will they say if it's not a real ID? No. If you try to go into a courthouse, what will they say? No. Anyway, it's interesting that our country is concerned about your identification, but not when it comes to voting. <laughs> you don't need an ID when it comes to voting, but you need an ID when it comes to getting on a plane or going into a federal building. So real IDs. So that, that leads me to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to be focusing on our identity in Christ. And one of the reasons why I think this is significant is because a lot of people don't live like their identity should make them live. In other words, a lot of people have this mindset that says, you know what, I am just like you. I'm no different than you, except that, you know, Jesus died for my sins. And there are bumper stickers that convey the same kind of feeling. But here's the reality. You are different. If you're a follower in Jesus Christ, you are different. You're meant to be the light in a dark world. And too many times we just try to, we try to fit in, you know. We don't want to tell anybody maybe that we're a Christian or concerned about what they might think or what they might say. But it's like, how are we going to make a difference if we hide our real ID? And so when it comes to the Bible, I want to look at three different areas when it comes to our real ID. The first one is, at the very, at page one of your Bible, which is Genesis. It says, for God created man in his what? In his own image. And the, the, the word is imago day. Can you guys say imago day? Imago day, the image of God. That's what that means, the image of God. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, the imago day. He created him, male and female, he created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, 
and have dominion over all the fish and all the sea and all the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so what's being communicated here is simply that when God created us, we were like his crown jewel. We were these people that he, he speaks to the other members of the Trinity, right? The Holy Spirit and the Son and says, let us make man in our own image. And so whenever you see any human being, and it doesn't matter what they've been up to, good or bad, you are literally looking at someone who is an image bearer. And of course, it doesn't mean that we have the physical characteristics of God, right? It, it, it means that because God is a spirit. But, but it means like we share characteristics, the, the characteristics of God, you know, the, the intellect, the ability uh, to speak, right? Um, it's interesting here in this uh, passage right here, uh, when God, you know, creates man and woman, um, he, he, he looks at them, he blesses them, but then he actually speaks to them. So he created them, he says, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. That's who we are. And and, and we're made male and female, right? And it doesn't mean that God is male or female or androgynous. It just simply means that, you know, when you take the combined totals of a male and a female, those share in the characteristics and the attributes of God. And that's why it's kind of sad today when we, we hear about in our culture that people don't appreciate that Imago Day. And you got a lot of people now that are saying, okay, I want you to call me by my preferred pronoun. I was talking to Philip Deem uh, a couple days ago. For those of you who have been here for a while, you guys remember, you remember who Philip Deem is. I'm going to bump into this and knock myself over. Uh, Philip Deem used to be one of the elders of this church. He was here for a long time. And I was asking him about this one individual. And he said, well, he doesn't go to our church anymore. I'm like, well, what happened? Well, let's just say he got into cross-dressing. And the reality is, so I said, so where does he go? Well, he goes to a church that's a little bit more accommodating to that. It's like we are made in the image of God. When God creates us, right, does he make a mistake? Does he make a mistake in our pronouns? But the enemy is right there, right, to convince you and to deceive you. You're not really made in the Imago Dei. You can change your gender. You can change your sex. And so what God does here is not only does God create man and woman in his image, not only does he speak to them because God's whole creative process was using words. And we we talked about that several weeks ago about uh, we have the words of death and life in our mouth. And everything about God's creation is he, he spoke everything. He used words of life, right? And I don't know about you, but that's really hit me pretty hard. And I make sure every interaction that I have, I think about, am I speaking words of life? And I've asked the Holy Spirit, like, let me know if I'm not speaking words of life. And I I have to be honest, he's told me on occasion or two or three or four, uh, you're not speaking words of life. You're speaking words of death. They're negative. Sometimes you talk about people or you can get on the verge of gossip or you receive this kind of information. But God speaks to the, God speaks to the woman and the man and says, I want you to do one thing, be fruitful and multiply. And then the last thing he does in this, in this picture right here is that he gives them authority. He tells him to subdue the land and have dominion, which is another way of saying authority, 
dominion over the fish and the sea and the birds. And so what, what God does is he says, okay, I've created all of this, and I've created man in my image, and therefore I want you to kind of govern this planet. And in the process, we have the ability to create, not with... Um, not making things out of nothing, right? That's, that's ex nihilo. That's what God did. He made the world out of nothing. But we have these resources, these creative resources that God's given us, and, or we can manufacture these resources because of what we have um, as far as sediments and that. And we have this ability to create like God. We have this ability to speak like God in the sense that we can speak words of life, or words and death in people, right? And so that's what God had planned when it comes to everybody that's involved in creation is God says, you know, I want you to understand who you are. I want you to understand. And it's really phenomenal when you think about it. The creator of the universe that made everything you see the galaxies, the atmosphere, the planets, the mountains, the waters, all of this beauty. God says, that's good, but I'm going to make man in my own image, and I want them to govern everything that I've made. And the psalmist in Psalm 8 recognizes this just this reality, and he says, when I look at the night sky and I see the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars that are set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should even care for them, yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor you gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority. Think about that. That is your real ID. That is what God has made you. But you know who was threatened by that? None other than the serpent, right? Satan, the ancient one. And so right, right as that happens, it's like he didn't even waste any time. So let's talk about the second part of this, um, our, our real identity. There has been an identity theft. Has anybody here ever had someone claim they were them and had experienced identity theft. I was reading about this one girl and she went to the store and she was declined and, and she couldn't get credit anywhere. She couldn't finance a house. Her mother died and eventually after they were trying to take care of all the arrangements, they realized that her mother claimed that she was her daughter. And it took years to be able to get some kind of a credit. And in our culture today, that's one of the number one things that are happening to people is identity theft, right? And, and uh, even our internet sites, you know, they're coming up with these annoying passwords and two-time two verification. Oh, I can't stand two-time verification. But they're concerned about your identity. They don't want your identity to be stolen. So, so what, does, what does Satan do when he realizes what's going on and that man is made in his image? Well, let's look at this verse right here. Because he doesn't wait long, does he? He doesn't wait long because he's threatened by this reality because he doesn't want us to live with that understanding that we were created in God's image and that we are the ones that are supposed to have authority and govern this planet, right? He doesn't like that thought. He doesn't like the thought of us submitting to God. He doesn't like the thought of us even following God. And so what he does is he, he does the same thing that he did when he was in heaven, when he was this beautiful angel, was gifted with music, just like the crown jewel of angels. 
he says, you know what, I want to be like God. And then later on in Revelation, you read that he was cast out of heaven. But so he's here, and he's like, I got to steal their identity. So he says to the woman, did God really say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. So, so what's going on right now is uh, everybody knows that Satan is a deceiver. He's the father of all lies, that his, his native language is lying. And so what he's doing right here is he's trying to confuse, confuse the woman, confuse her. Did God really say that, Caroline? Are you sure that God said that? Because it really doesn't seem like that's really what he meant. And is it possible that you misheard? And, and, and the woman is kind of like caught off guard because she kind of shares what God said, but she kind of throws some extra stuff in there. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of any of the trees in the garden, right? That's true, amen? But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Is that right? Neither shall you touch it lest you die. That last part, God didn't say. If you touch it, you're going to die. What did he say? If you partake of it, if you partake of it, you're going to die. And, and, but the serpent said to the woman, what does he say? You will surely not die because he's in the process now of stealing our identity. You will surely not die, he said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So how does Satan try to change our identity? He knows that if they fail and they partake of that garden, they're not going to live forever. They're going to die. And it says in the Bible that Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And it was like 15 minutes into life. And Satan comes up there and he snatches this identity, which ultimately leads to sin, right? And God in his mercy says to Adam and Eve, you know, you got to get out of the garden. And he, he shortened the lifespan. Because how many people would want to live for eternity in a sin nature? And so that's what's happening here. That's what Satan does. Is Satan took your identity. And you know what? Many Christians today, this is bad habit five, right? They, they don't know who they are in Christ. Many Christians today pay no attention to Satan. Oh, that's not real. That's just a mythical figure. And you know what? Satan loves that. Satan's like, my feelings aren't hurt if you don't believe in me. You know, my feelings aren't hurt. Just don't believe in God. And so what, what happens then is that Satan, all of a sudden, he, he, he moves from this realm where... Now he is the, uh, the God of this world. So I think there's a verse up there. The God of this world. Paul writes about this in 2 Corinthians. He says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel or the glory of Christ, who is what? the Imago Day. It's 
the God of this world. And we see his handprint everywhere. We see it in morality that our country is experiencing now. We see it just in, in chaos. We see Satan behind uh, the media to, to terrify you and to frighten you. He's all over the place. He's operating. And many of us that are Christians, we don't pay attention to a spiritual reality. And that's why God gave us the book of Job, amen? God gives us the book of Job to communicate to us, hey, there is a spiritual battle that's going on for you, right? There, there, are, there is a spiritual battle. There's demonic forces. There's Satan that wants to destroy people, wants to destroy you. But you know what we do as Christians sometimes is we forget about that and we just look at the flesh and blood of people and say that person is a bad person. Because remember what Paul says in Ephesians, right? Our battle is not against what? Not against flesh and blood, but against the dark forces, right? The, the rulers, the authorities, the principalities. We don't recognize it. And, and if we don't recognize it, then all of a sudden, we really don't have any way to address it. And so what is the God of the world? What, what does he do today? It says right there, he blinds, he blinds the minds of who? Unbelievers. And so what's being communicated here is that he doesn't blind your eyes if you're a faith of Christian. He doesn't blind your eyes but he blinds the eyes of unbelievers, right? And too many times as Christians, we don't have concern for people that don't know Christ. And they're being blinded. And it's like God wants us to step up and say, hey, Lord, do not allow this to happen. Do not blind, do not make their eyes blind and God wants you also to be involved in people's lives and, and sharing about Christ, right? Because if somebody is in blindness, do they know they're in blindness? They have no idea unless what? Unless we tell them. We tell them about the light. Then they can see they're in darkness. And so it says the first thing it says about Satan is that he was craftier than all the rest. He is so crafty. I mean, what are we seeing today in our country? What do you mean I have to address you by your pronoun? How many people around here says, you know, Hitler, I hated her. A pronoun is irrelevant, right? It's the person was a bad person, right? Well, what if somebody said, does related, oh, he really was a female and he wants to be known now as a girl. Pronouns have no, they're descriptive. But they should be descriptive of a reality, right? Biological reality. Who would have thought we would have come to this point? Satan comes to kill, still, and destroy and the only people on here that can help them see is us. And sometimes we're just so focused on our own life, our own problems, that we forget why we're here. And we forget that the world is being blinded by the enemy.
But here's the good news. In the last section right here, we were created for a purpose. Created for a purpose. And what is that purpose? Talks about it here in the Great Commission. And Jesus came to his disciples. This is when he's about to die, right? And he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Who has all the authority? Jesus. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always. When? Is this just for the disciples? No, because he says, I'm with you when? To the end of the age. Like he's with you forever, right? And it's, it's interesting because I've seen so many people like when they, they read about the apostles and some of the things they did, maybe they cast out some demons or maybe they healed some people. And, and, and I've heard people say, well, yeah, Jesus gave them authority, but he doesn't give us any kind of authority to do something like that. And it's kind of ironic, right, because I've read commentaries where it says that as soon as the apostles died out, the, 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 the spiritual gifts, the signs and wonders, they, they disappeared. Let me ask you a question. Do we need those today? Are we okay without those happening anymore? Do you think God would say, hey, you know what? As far as the next 2,000 years after you guys, they're just going to have to figure it out because there's no longer, I'm not give, I've only given you authority. How many people know what a disciple means? A, a disciple is not some, some Christian that is up on this up, upper echelon of spirituality. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. There, we've made these distinctions like, hey, I'm going to take a discipleship training class. And the reality is that Jesus says to the people, he says, first of all, Christianity is not about you because what does he tell his disciples to do? He doesn't tell them to become a disciple. They're already disciples. They're followers of Jesus. But he says you've got to get more people, more people. And, and this is an area, again, where we, we forget that we're here for a purpose. We are here to expand the kingdom of God. That's what we're here for. And the reality is, is that too many people look at their conversion to Christ as, oh, this is my guarantee I'm going to heaven. So I can just live my life and kind of shut out this reality that Jesus really wants us to make disciples and expand the kingdom of God. Most people think that are Christians that, you know, hey, I'm saved, that's all that counts. I know where I'm going. But in the process, when we live our life focusing on ourselves, we don't show care and concern about where other people are going. Oh, I don't want them to think bad of me. I don't want them to be offended. I, 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 don't, I, I don't want them not to like me or think I'm religious. Church, where are they going if they don't know Christ? So many people are like, well, what's God's will for my life, right? You can get any kind of job or career or anything that you want to become, in that job or career, your job is to make disciples. So if I'm in the marketplace, yeah, I can make lots of money and maybe I have this gift of making money, but I'm in the marketplace and my job is to make disciples where God has me placed. If you're a teacher, yeah, you know what, we can't preach on the campus, but you know what, you can have coffee after school. But God has placed us in these different spheres where we have connections with people. And these are the folks that God wants us to really 
reach for Jesus. But if we keep hiding and say, oh, I'm no different than you guys are. You know, I just believe in Jesus. We are different. We are different. And, and I believe this authority that Jesus gives is not just for the disciples of his day, but for people that have committed their life to being on his mission, right? That's when God works is when you are on the mission, right? You have concern for people. You want people to come to know Christ. You're like, God, speak to me. Be with me, right? That's when I think God will say, because he'll look at your faith, right? He'll look at your faith and he'll say, I can use you where you're at and I can do special things through you. But we got to believe that we have authority, <laughs> that it just wasn't for the disciples, right? Because at the very beginning of creation, the disciples weren't there, right? And God said, you have authority. But who didn't like that? It was the enemy, right? The enemy didn't like the reality that you had authority. But you know what happened when Jesus came? Do you know what happened when Jesus came? Uh, put that last verse on there, Jim. When, when Jesus came, it says in Colossians, it says, and you, this is referring to us, who were, were dead in our trespasses and our uncircumcision of our flesh, God made us alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt and stood against us with its legal demands, right? And here's the part that I want you to see. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So what he's saying there is, you're restored. You're restored to this, this time of creation where God has given us all authority, right? You're restored to your natural order here. And it says, what Jesus did is he disarmed the rulers and the authorities. And who's he talking about there? He disarmed Satan and his army, right? And so in a sense, we have Satan who used to have this power control where we feared death, right? And what Jesus did is he took out his fangs. And death is not a reality for people that accept Jesus. He disarmed them, took out the fangs. And so uh, now today, um, what happens is the, the enemy just goes around and he deceives people. And he uses other people to have them deceive other people because that's his mode of operation because he's been defeated because Jesus died for you and he restored you to that imago day, right? And then why does Jesus go away? Does Jesus go up to heaven to say, hey, you know what? I don't want to have any part of you guys for over 2,000 years because I'm not going to give you any authority. No, he goes up to heaven because he wants us to carry on their tradition, to lead people to Jesus. That's what he wants us to do. And, and whatever area, whatever gifting you has, you know, the purpose of the, of the, of the gifts are, are not to ignore them or not to use them. The purpose of the gifts is to, is to reach people for Jesus and to build up the body of Christ. But when we don't do that, we, we've lost our identity. This is who God calls us to be. I was reading this story about this little boy. He had this boat, and he was just trying to see how it would work, and so he put the boat in the water, and, and he had a string on the boat, and the boat just, uh, it went out. And everything was working good until all of a sudden the current came up. When the current came up, uh, the string snapped, and he tried to go over the dock. He tried to catch his boat, but he couldn't do it. He lost his boat. 
And it was a boat that he built, that he created. And so the little boy was devastated. But one day, he just happened to be going into a secondhand thrift shop. And in the window, he saw his boat. So he goes up to the owner of the shop and he says, that's my boat. I created that boat and that boat belongs to me. And the person at the store, the owner says, you know, I paid someone to get that boat. And so you just can't take that boat home. It's going to cost you something. So the little kid goes home and he looks for all of his money, all of his change, everything that's in his piggy bag, piggy bank, and he goes up to the store and he says, I got a dollar. Here's all I have. And the owner of the store says, sold. And now the little boy has the boat back that he created, that he made. And what's the moral of that story when it comes to Jesus? Is that Satan did all of that he could do to get us abandoned. But Jesus comes back and he gives everything he has, right? He gives his life for you so that he can redeem you, which is another way of saying to purchase you and to buy you back. And why does Jesus do that? Because your identity was stolen. But now you are back to who you were meant to be. To live your life with authority, to, to live your life in faith, to believe that God can use you, and to ask God to, to help your heart so that you have passion and concern and care for those that don't know Christ. And then I, that's the reality. And the final thing, the final area that I want to talk about today is this idea that um, this purpose that we were created talked about it. It's to reach people for Jesus. But, you know, in the process, the victory has already been achieved. And sometimes as Christians, we, we live our life forgetting that the victory has already been achieved. Satan is fangless. You know, there's so many times in the Bible where the disciples or other followers of Christ, they're, they're going out there and they're seeing people that are demon-possessed and, and, and the demons know who they are and they're afraid. There was even this other story in Mark 9 I was reading this morning where the disciples, right, the ones that Jesus gave authority to, they saw someone else cast out a demon that wasn't in their party. And they go up to Jesus and they say, hey, you know, we saw these guys cast out demons in your name, but they're not of our group. Jesus says, leave them alone. For the, when they do so in my name, they don't do it in hatred. In other words, what was being communicated there is that you're not the only people that he's given authority to. And so we have to live our life taking back that authority from the enemies in the spiritual places. We have to live our life knowing that we're not just called to be like other people, but we're in a battle because Satan has blinded the eyes of the people. But the victory has been achieved. So don't live your life like you don't know who's on the winning squad. Don't live your life. I ended with this. I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. And they're not going to the Super Bowl again. So you know what I did last night? I rewatched when Pittsburgh played the Cardinals 
in the Super Bowl. And I remember this game, it was so tense, you know, there was this one play where James Harrison catches an interception at the end of the half where the other team is about to score, they're like on the two-yard line, right? The other team is about to score, and I'm freaking out at home when I watch it live. But, but now that the game is over, and I know the result, I was watching this, this is the play that James Harrison steps in front of Kurt Warner's pass, grabs it, and somehow runs 100 yards for a touchdown before halftime. And then he falls on his back, and he says, where's the oxygen mask? <laughs> and then St. Louis, or not St. Louis, but they, uh, the Cardinals, they, they score this touchdown to Larry Fitzgerald. And I remember when I was watching that live, I'm like, oh, my God, there's only like two minutes left in the game. What's going to happen? And I remember the announcer saying, but they left Ben two minutes. And so at the end of the game, with about 40 seconds left to go, I know, this drive. There's going to be a penalty here. They're going to get called for holding. They'll be set back. And I remember how I was stressed out back then. And they're going to eventually hit San Antonio Holmes over here. Then they'll, they'll throw another one over there to San Antonio Holmes. And with 40 seconds left, I'm like, okay, he's going to throw an incompletion on the, on the left side of the field to San Antonio Holmes. And San Antonio Holmes should have caught that pass, right? So he throws it, and he misses it. I'm like, yeah, I remember that. But here's the play where they win the whole game. They're going to throw it to the right side to San Antonio Holmes. And even though that catch was easy, this catch he's going to do is very difficult. And the ball is going to be placed where no one else can get it but San Antonio Holmes. I'm like, here it comes. Touchdown! Super Bowl champions, Pittsburgh Steelers. I, I watched this game knowing already the result. We know the result of Satan. We know that he lost. He lost. We know that. We got to live in victory. Victory. Remember our song, Victory in Jesus, my Savior. That's about all I know, but that's what that, we have victory. So live your life with the understanding who you are and that Jesus has done all the work that's necessary for you to live in victory. Amen? Amen. Let me pray.